he's he's going later in the in the agenda, so um, it'll be fine to to wait a bit. So I'm just going to kick things off with a super brief introduction, um, and if I can ask a favor of the other co-hosts, as I'm sharing my screen, if you can let people in from the waiting room, that would be uh, much much appreciated. Thank you. Cool. So let me go ahead with this. I'll try to keep this super brief um, so we can just dive right into the pitches. Um, Want to just welcome you all to our monthly demo day in partnership with TechWedi. Um, if you've attended these before, you know I, I try to keep these introductions really short. Um, but this month, we're so privileged to have five awesome founders from the Viaca network uh, who are building climate-friendly and sustainable startups from across the world uh, share what they're working on. You'll hear, you heard some introductions and you'll hear more in depth from the founders in a second, so I won't do uh, a too, too in-depth introduction of them. Um, we also have a feedback panel of investors today. Unfortunately, Ryan uh, had a, a last minute emergency come up so he can't make it, um, but I'll do quick intros of, of our other investors. We have Jules from Global Ventures, um, which is a leading investor in emerging market founders, um, specifically in the Middle East and Africa. And Jules and, and Global Ventures are, are um, headquartered out of the UAE. Raleigh uh, works with Presidio Ventures, which is the corporate venture capital arm of Sermitomo Corporation. Um, focusing on investments in mobility, internet of things, AI, food and agriculture, logistics, and infrastructure. That's just a few of the, the fields that they invest in. Um, and then we have Iris Wu from Aramco Ventures, the corporate arm of Aramco, um, which includes a, a 1.5 billion sustainability fund supporting Aramco's ambitions to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So. Huge thank you to both the founders and investors for, for joining the event today um, and sharing what they're building and sharing their insights. For those of you that don't know what the Viaca Network is, um, we are a digital first community for founders, investors, experts, and tech builders with a connection or interest in, in the MENA region. Among other things, we have a members only Slack workspace, a database of network members that can facilitate introductions, um, monthly virtual and in-person networking events. We actually have um, a happy hour for network members in New York City next week. And then uh, later this month, we have a panel discussion about the state of startups in Palestine. Um, so those are just examples of some of the events that, that we hold on a monthly basis. The network is free to join at the moment, um, and we're about to hit 400 members across 30 cities worldwide, um, ranging from, from uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi in the Emirates all the way to Silicon Valley um, in California, and really just about everything in between. So if you're interested in being a part of this community, uh, I'll share an application in the Zoom chat uh, after, after this introduction. This past month, we also launched, uh, as part of Viaca, a Viaca Connect platform, where we pulled together the top fractional service providers in our network, uh, put them in one place, and made it super easy to access our services. The service providers that are under the Viaca Connect umbrella um, are all network members vetted for quality and experience and have worked in North America, um, MENA, and Europe. We have a, another event coming up at the beginning of August uh, where we're kind of doing like a launch webinar um, about Viaca Connect, introducing the service providers um, and sharing more about their experience and credentials. And starting in August, um, the service providers that are part of Viaca Connect will also be offering members workshops and office hours um, on topics ranging from hiring technical staff to financial planning, to legal and fundraising advice. So we're super excited to introduce this as, as part of the Viaca platform as well. Um, finally, I just wanna thank our community partner for this event, um, TechWedi. They partner with us uh, for uh, 
our demo days every month. Um, and as a lot of you might know, they're the leading nonprofit organization for the MENA diaspora in tech. Personally, um, I kind of wear two hats. I'm on the operating board of TechWadi as well. Um, and this is an image from the TechWadi annual forum last fall, which gathered over 300 attendees in person in the Bay Area. Uh, and we're getting ready to announce the dates for the 2023 annual forum. So um, would love to meet everyone in person who can, who can make it out to the Bay Area for that. Um, Without further ado, I want to just share a quick note on format. So each pitch and feedback will last about 20 minutes um, when all, thing is, all things are said and done. Um, the founder will have the first 10 minutes to present. After that, we'll open up to questions from investors. And if anyone from the audience has a question, post it in the chat and we'll try to raise it or the founder can come in after their pitch and, and try to answer that. Um, I'm going to be keeping time and posting two minute warnings in the chat as well. Uh, and because we have five founders to get through, I'm going to be pretty strict. I hate doing it, but um, try to keep everyone on time. So that's it for me on the introduction front. Um, Shada, you are going to go first. So Without further ado, I'll stop sharing. Um, and I believe you should have the ability to um, go ahead and, and share your screen. Yeah, let me share my screen. Second. Um. Can't see my presentation, although it's open. One more second. Um, I can't seem to share the presentation. I don't know why. Are you able to share your screen, first of all, regardless of the? I can share screen, but it only shows me that I can share uh, my um, kind of web pages, so not the uh, PowerPoint on oh, just one minute. Okay. Let me check. Okay, this is it. Sorry for the technical problems. The first one is always <laughs> the test subject. Uh, okay, everybody can see the screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Shada Musalam. I am the CEO of Agritopia for Agricultural Technology. And our company focuses on creating uh, control systems for indoor farming, as well as control systems for irrigation and fertilization system, which together we call fertigation system. And our, our story began when we uh, noticed several problems in the agricultural sector, which were uh, the high uh, usage uh, of water uh, within the traditional agriculture and the uh, hard accessibility to the water sources, especially in our areas. Moreover, in Palestine more specifically, there is limited land available for farming or access to land. And in addition to these uh, problems, we face the seasonability of products as well as high usage of pesticides. So uh, my co-founder thought about the idea of indoor farming, which was not very popular in this region before. And we developed the auto farm system, which was our first product. Uh, auto farm system uses specific quantities of water and fertilizers, which reduces the water and chemical consumptions in indoor farming and allows for at least nine cycles of farming throughout the year, which is year, year long. And we went through several MVPs and the last design we came up with with our unit is made of glass and a bottom or uh, of concrete coupled with a, a fully automated hydroponic system. And our unit is very compact in size because of the problem of lack uh, of land available for farming. So it's five meter by seven, and it has the capacity for at least 1,600 uh, plants within the space. 
And uh, we noticed that the market size for the vertical farming is quite large since the uh, vertical farming, which is indoor farming, uh, saved at least uh, or produces at least 250, uh, 240 times more product uh, than traditional farming, as well as reducing worldwide at least 99% of the usage of land and water. And so far, our traction, we've been working uh, in throughout several years, uh, at least six years, to develop the products and work in the field. And our revenues uh, have increased uh, yearly, and uh, we forecast at least $120,000 for this year in revenue. And we have uh, installed about 88 hydroponic units for farmers and four mobile containers, especially for area C. I'm not sure how familiar you are with Palestine, but it's an area where you cannot put anything fixed. We are also the only people who were awarded from Palestine to enter the water and energy for food program, uh, the MENA region call. And we have been going through the IGNITE program in Palestine as well, and we are running for a 50,000 grant from the World Bank right now. Uh, these are some pictures of our products. Uh, this is the mobile container, which is used to farm uh, the cattle feed or fodder system, as well as the vertical, vertical hydroponic uh, system. We also have uh, developed a fertigation control system, which we are currently installing for a whole city. It controls all of the outdoor area irrigation and fertilization of, of outdoor plants. And we are um, developing as well a smaller version for smallholder farmers and gardens, house gardens, which is called AG Smart. And this system will be uh, controlled through an application on the phone. It has an Arabic and English interface, and it's very easy to use. Uh, being near Israel, which is a leading country in the agri-tech department, we have a lot of competitors. However, we pride ourselves in the high-quality products we have. Uh, we Arabize the interface of our products and uh, uh, control systems, as well as the convenience of uh, the maintenance and a lower cost compared to our competitors. We uh, also noticed, noticed several other pro problems in the region or in the agricultural sector throughout working all these years with farmers. And we uh, are launching a digital platform named Akaria, which means fertile land in, uh, uh, in Kanani or Canaanite language. Uh, the platform or the problems we saw that the farmers faced were uh, having no guidance from a unified source and the arbitrary choice of what to farm each cycle, which leads, which leads to mismatch between supply and demand. And uh, this leads to really a variation in prices when they sell their produce. So our platform aims to give the farmers the information they need, as well as the technical agricultural support while linking the farmers to the SMEs in order to facilitate the marketing and uh, provide a unified platform for stakeholders to reach the farmers. Uh, the agricultural support will come through a 24 seven help desk with a live agronomist answering the phone. It will have smart suggestions for the farmers based on their location and weather conditions and market demand, as well as a marketplace uh, to sell in bulk uh, when they collect the produce and in the future, a very valuable data source. Uh, so basically this is our interface. Akalira platform is simply to create a profile, pin their location and get the smart suggestions. Uh, our team right now is us uh, in Agritopia, three co-founders. Uh, I have a background in environmental sciences. My CTO has over 40 years of uh, coding, engineering, and software development. And our third uh, technical engineer and co-founder, Aham, is a megatronics engineer. We have also Ramsey, a consultant and brand management and user experience a specialist, which helps us uh, throughout our journey. 
And for the project of Akkaria, the digital platform only, we have coupled or partnered with an amazing developers company called Buildex uh, uh, to develop the uh, online platform. And there are about eight, uh, eight developers in this uh, company. And our growth strategy is to focus on expanding locally as well as expanding to the surrounding region, especially in the Gulf and MENA. Uh, we already are talking to several sister companies that have a similar customer base, and we are thinking to, uh, to market our products through them. Our ask is about 400,000K uh, in order to expand locally in the MENA region and for product development, as well as expand our team. And if you have any questions, you can reach us on the following links. Thank you for your time and thank you for the opportunity, Hani. Great, thank you so much, uh, Shada. I will um, just pin um, Iris, uh, Jules and Raleigh's screens as well. And then, um, uh, yep, uh, open it up for you all to go ahead and, and start asking questions uh, of Shada about, um, about Agritopia. I just need to I'm happy to start if that's okay, hon. Go for it, yep. Awesome. Shada, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it's clear you're, you're very passionate about this problem and about the solution you're bringing, and you have a very clear vision about sort of what the ecosystem needs to look like in terms of products mm -hmm. and services to address these issues. Um, so sort of on that topic, you know, I think you've got four current products, the control systems, yeah. the growing systems, and then you've got this fifth one in development too. Yeah. Uh, so my question is sort of one about, you know, how do you choose uh, what to focus on, you know, do you worry you might get stretched thin as these products have different, you know, customers and cost structures? How do you think about that? Uh, well, uh, we, because our team is diversified, uh, the different team members focus on the different things. So, for example, for the Akaria project, it's the company Buildex, which is currently focusing on building the MVP. So we just give guidance. So they do the main work. And this is very good for us because we can focus on other uh, main products. And uh, the uh, development of the systems um, happens because actually the clients, we have so much tractions that the clients come to us. And because our team develops the software and the hardware as well, we have the capacity to customize our products to the needs of the clients. So for example, our BCT, they had the problem and we came with the solution. And now we are, we build a whole system for them that can be replicated in other cities as well. So we are balancing the uh, requests that come to us in the field. And uh, for example, for AG Smart, the small controller version, when we built the large system, we said, no, we have to serve as well the small scale farmer. So because we had this large scale product, we could. Uh, minimize it into a smaller version and uh, hopefully we can expand very fast with that because uh, the software is 99% uh, done so it's very easy to to ship it outside of the country as well. Great thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I'll follow on Shada thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, my question is, um, what are some of the CapEx uh, spend that you'd be looking at to develop um, your product line? And, and also, what are the challenges that you could be looking at into entering different markets, such as the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and mm -hmm. outside of Palestine? So our biggest expense uh, currently is the hardware. And our hardest challenge in Palestine in particular is getting the inputs to build the hardware. Uh, so we're looking into um, those countries in order to export our production or manufacturing of the hardware outside of Palestine. So we're going to look in the next month at Jordan and Lebanon as manufacturing hubs for the uh, hardware, which will make the export easier outside the country. 
uh, this is our um, main, uh, like highest expense because you have to get a lot of inputs in order to build the hardware before you sell it. But once you sell it, you make really good uh, margins on it. So this is what's happening currently with our biggest project in Rawabi City. Um, so uh, basically we have the uh, structure and software uh, built. So our main expense would be getting uh, large scale inputs in order to kind of mass manufacture the hardware for it. Thank you on, on that, that uh, answer. Um, what about uh, entering into the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia? What are like the plans and go yeah. to market so for that approach? Uh, we have uh, um, council, like uh, people who counsel us of how to enter the UAE and Saudi markets uh, because of the water energy for food program that I talked about. Uh, Veritech is part of it, and they have uh, several advisors as well as CWAS and Kemanex in Egypt. So we have several hubs that help us enter into different countries from uh, providing information about the taxation, registration, uh, uh, market studies. So now CUS will help us with the study, for example, uh, of manufacturing in Jordan or Lebanon. And so we have different hubs helping us and people, as well as the companies themselves that are in the hubs, because we all work with farmers. They have the same customer base, but they have different products. So we can enter the markets easily through uh, others. We call them sister companies, which are companies that have the same customer base, but, but different products. So we've approached companies uh, right now in Iraq, uh, Lebanon, as well as uh, North Africa in order to market our products. And uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia will, will be entered through uh, doing uh, firstly a market research. And then if we manufacture it in Jordan, it will be much easier because another company that manufacture another product did these same steps and it was, very easy for them to enter the Saudi markets when, once they started manufacturing in Jordan. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, maybe I missed it on, but uh, what is the, the value or the, the value proposition for each product or the impact it has on the client? So, you know. So the, the first product, which is the auto farm, it gives the advantage for farmers that they can farm the whole year and not uh, uh, be based on seasonability of products because of the open farming. And especially right now with the global warming and changes, like right now what Yusuf said, it's really, really hot, uh, abnormally hot than normal. And uh, so the even the rain cycles are, are shifting and so the traditional farming is not yielding as it did before. So having a controlled environment first allows the farmer to farm the whole year. Secondly, it allows them to farm uh, really high value crops that do not exist in nature here, such as like blackberries, blueberries, sensitive things that don't grow here, but have very high value in the market. So they can focus on really special kind of crops that they can sell for much higher than traditional crops. Uh, as for the fertigation systems, uh, the biggest value proposition we offer because uh, the highest competition is in that side, so that side, sorry, because of the Israeli uh, products that are available in the market. But what our customers uh, faced, and we saw like a lot of people wanted a solution for, is that the interface lacked Arabic, so we made it in Arabic, very easy to use for uh, like the normal farmer in Palestine or in the MENA region. Secondly, the maintenance. They had a really hard time with maintenance since uh, it was very costly when they bought foreign uh, units and they had to pay double the cost of the unit just to maintain it. So we offer a free maintenance for, year, for a year after purchase as well as a really reduced cost for maintenance long-term afterwards. Uh, and lastly, for the uh, Akaria platform, the digital platform for farmers, the value proposition is that we, we are the only people who are doing that right now. The status quo is 
uh, that the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Agriculture provides technical support very randomly and very sporadically, not when the farmer needs it. And there is no online market for fresh produce, at least uh, in the region or in the area around us. So there is a similar platform just in Saudi Arabia, but it's just restricted for the use of Saudi Arabian farmers. And you only have to have uh, Saudi numbers in or uh, phone number in order to activate it. So we cannot enter with the platform in Saudi Arabia, but we can enter with the hardware uh, over there. Okay, thanks. So I hope this sums it up. <laughs> no, it's good. I mean, uh, uh... On, on the first part, for instance, like, so all your long high value crops, do you already have kind of the revenue, the added revenue for these farmers or the end clients? Yeah, we did the, like, um, uh, I forgot the term in English, uh, sorry. Um, like calculation uh, analysis, cost analysis for the different crops. So we show the farmers that you can make back the money, the cost of the unit. If you, uh, for example, after four cycles, you already make a profit enough to cover the cost, initial cost of the unit. And right now we are in discussion with different uh, microfinance institutions in order to offer loans to farmers, uh, which are reduced uh, and over a long period of time, they agreed to give us a loan over five to seven years for the customers in order to purchase the uh, greenhouse unit. Uh, fully automated and the uh, farmer can repay the cost of unit of the unit month by month instead of putting a large amount of money initially for the build because we're still a small like not large scale startup so we cannot afford to give the loans directly to the farmers we need like a microfinance institution to come in between and cover uh this um this issue thanks so Awesome. Thank you, Sada, so much um, for your presentation. It's time to move on to the next one. Um, uh, but yeah, really, thank you so much for sharing. Clement, you are going to be up next. Um, so I will just pin your screen. Um, and yeah, feel free to dive in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm going to share my old screen so you should be able to see me uh, in a big video thing on the right hand side. Uh, so my name is Dr. Clément Seed. I'm the CEO of Sequester. So what we're doing at Sequester is a point source carbon capture. Now you might wonder why do we need that? Uh, you know, the reason is we all use energy, a lot of that energy is coming from fossil fuels. Um, chances are that we're still gonna keep using fossil fuels for many decades. In the meantime, we just talked about the issue of you know, growing crops in the Middle East. Climate change is showing all these issues to everyone. I'm now in Europe wearing a long sleeve shirt and thankfully there is an AC just behind me, um, but not everybody has that level of comfort. Um, People want more comfort, uses more energy, and a lot of that energy releases CO2 when it's being transformed. So what we're doing at Sequester, we're basically capturing that CO2 before it reaches the atmosphere. This way, uh, with, our, um, with our affordable process, we have a process that at scale is 30 US dollars per ton capture cost. So with that process, we can capture the CO2 from the large point source emitters. Um, when I say, oops, sorry. I don't know what, uh, I'll go and use this one. So when I say scalability, the key concept in scalability is actually that we can work from 10,000 tons of CO2 per year emission. So think of a little boiler, for instance, to produce heat and steam all the way to a million tons. So think of a large power plant, um, you know, producing hundreds of megawatts of electricity. Uh, the process is uh, green because what we use in our technology is actually an earth abundant um, granulated metal carbonate. And this material is just 
created from a powder. So here you can see that powder of mixed potassium and calcium carbonate. Uh, we use extrusion spheronization in order to make it in little beads. And these beads can then be used in the system uh, that we developed. And I'll talk about it in a few uh, seconds. So where we are in our technology development is at the stage where we're getting ready to test the process with different flue gases, so with different point source emitters. And we already have an agreement with a uh, pilot customer in Central California where the technology will be piloted in 2025. Now, how does it work? You got the CO2 coming from the point source emitter. So think about a power plant, a refinery, a cement or steel plant. The CO2 concentration that our technology can handle is actually quite broad. We can work from as low as 3.5%, uh, which is the CO2 in a power plant, all the way to more than 20%, which is what's coming from some cement producing processes. So the flue gas comes from the plant and then we'll go through our temperature swing absorption um, column where basically the CO2 reacts with the water present in the flue gas, they co-react and form a bicarbonate. So that's what I call uh, you know, prehistorical chemistry, what you're seeing at the bottom left of the slide where you got the CO2 and the water reacting with carbonates, creating bicarbonates. Nature does it really well in water. At Sequester, we do it extremely well in a gas solid interface with these beads. So once the CO2 is absorbed, what happens? Well, once the column is basically full, we can regenerate it uh, using temperature. So we heat up the process and the, the heat necessary for that can come from the flue gas uh, in, in a lot of cases. Uh, or can be a side stream of heat, you know, from um, water vapor. And that heat necessary for the regeneration will basically release the CO2 and the water. Now, what happens to the CO2? It's dried off uh, with a purity of more than 99.9% and a dew point of minus 40 Celsius. And then it can be transported for sequestration or usage. So, you might wonder why do we need a new carbon capture technology? Well, my answer is because the current technology, the amine process has been around for decades, but is really showing its uh, challenges. When we talk to a lot of customers, uh, they always complain about it and tell us, okay, how different are you from the amine process? So amine technologies are uh, taking CO2 and using a chemical reaction that's different than ours and generating some uh, noxious gases during the reprocessing. It also requires basically building a large chemical plant next to your power plant or next to your emitter. Now, we know that this is a mature technology, so we don't want to enter the market at that million ton stage. Actually, what we see as our beachhead market is at the bottom of that uh, oval and really at the 10 to 100,000 ton per year uh, emission per point source emitter. Uh, the sequester process is easy. The temperature swing absorption technology is well known by chemical engineers. The process to make the granules is at scale. We actually use a similar process to what's used by the agricultural industry. Uh, and the overall genius about it, if I may say, is really on how we're going to tweak, how we're tweaking the temperature swing absorption and how we're making the sorbent inside the technology. So growing from smaller systems, uh, we are attacking, you know, medium and larger point source emitters, because if we want to have an impact on climate change, we cannot just afford, you know, capturing just thousands of tons. We actually need to capture billions. And that's what we're capable of, taking from the small scale technology and then ramping up using, you know, the chemical engineering principle linked with temperature swing absorption, using the high throughput manufacturing for our sorbent, uh, and then the know-how that we gain from these smaller systems. Then we can attack systems that are on the order of the million tons per year and really make a huge difference 
uh, both for the climate, but also for our bottom line. So just telling you, you know, showing you uh, the real stuff and what's coming. So what you have on the left-hand side here is uh, the Centennial. So we gave them mountain names because we know that in clean tech, uh, when we are doing hardware, uh, in hardware, the first four letters are hard. And, uh, and, and so climbing mountains is really, you know, a good analogy, we think, to really providing a technology that is big, reliable, and, and low cost. Because we need to go from system that works in the lab all the way to showing it at scale in the field. Baldi was our first laboratory system that we developed at Caltech and what we're still using to improve the sorbent. Centennial is what we have right now in our headquarters in Los Angeles and what we can pack in a shipping container and uh, test at different test sites. So if there are uh, folks in the audience from um, oil and gas industry or are interested in novel carbon capture technology, I'd love to get in touch with you and, and discussing potential uh, testing of the technology because we want our product to fit your needs. Now, moving forward in our development, the Denali system that you see there on the right-hand side is our pilot, uh, which in this picture is a rendering of what it will look like in uh, Central California in collaboration with Wellhead. They are a power plant integrator and operator. Um, moving, you know, in that adventure of climbing mountains is not something that I'm doing alone. Uh, I'm actually uh, just a small piece of the puzzle, you know, a little circle in, in the slide. But, uh, you know, we go as a team. We, we met at Caltech. Where I was actually uh, working with Alan and Leopold uh, on that project for about a year uh, before we decided to start Sequester. So Sequester was uh, co-founded by the three of us. Uh, we had support from Miracle Plus as an accelerator, which is formerly known as Y Combinator China. And, you know, three geeks from Caltech realized that we also needed help on the business development. So I brought in uh, Ron Rogers, who's a former uh, chemical engineer and, and manager at UOP. Uh, Church Lewis is a finance uh, person. And, and Peter, who was uh, in many roles in technology uh, to markets. Uh, development. And, and we have wonderful interns. I actually forgot to update the slide, but uh, a third one, uh, Wu Wei, joined us a couple of days ago. Uh, and, and these guys and ladies are uh, bringing the technology from what we had in about that size to now something that is capable of capturing 300 kilos of CO2 per day, equivalent to 100 tons a year. Um, so why am I here? I told you in the for a few minutes ago, we're looking for partnerships, uh, especially for the North Africa and uh, Middle East region. Uh, we see our technology as a uh, answer to basically the issue with CO2 emissions. Uh, we can provide a retrofit to existing assets, um, but you know this is a market that has uh, a lot of players and that we. Um, coming from the US uh, are eager to, uh, to explore together. So in our technology and business development, you know, going from the prototyping to the pilot verification, my wish is to have strong partnership uh, with players in, uh, in the region. Now, obviously another part of the pitching is the money. Uh, we are here, um, you know, currently we opened our seed round, we have uh, $500,000 that have been um, uh, signed on um, just yesterday uh, by a, um, an investor who's acting as a bridge. Uh, so there is about uh, a bit less of $2 million now available. Uh, we are you know, going to use that money to continue the technology development. Uh, we're getting the system ready for third-party verification in 2024 and then scale up for that uh, Denali system that I showed you. And then, um, you know, looking at market development and opportunities. You know, we are a piece of the puzzle. The capture is really the expensive part that, uh, that we are solving. But then there is the other ecosystem, the transportation, and then the sequestration or utilization. So really working with partners 
across the value chain is something that you know we have started uh, through our participation in multiple accelerators, the C2V initiative, clean tech open, et cetera. Uh, but that's something that we want to increase and uh, you know, having geographically specific implementation uh, will, be, will be key in our success. Uh, so and with now, that- um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Perfect. I was yeah, that, that's the end. Uh, so I, I don't see your two minutes warning, but I figured <laughs> it was about 10 minutes. <laughs> no, you're perfect. Great. All but right. This is well, it. Thank you so I much, Clement. <laughs> um, super interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, I'll bring I'll bring the uh, judges back to the floor as well. So, would love to open up the the floor to you three um, to ask Clement questions. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to start off. Uh, Clement, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, obviously, a huge a global issue that you're trying to tackle here. So thank you for your your efforts there. Uh, I think, you know, at a high level, I'd love just to hear from you how the economics work from the customer side. Uh, are you sort of offering a pure OPEX sort of service here or is there CapEx involved too from the customer side? Just walk me through that. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Um, so the way we are seeing the project, especially the large projects will be, uh, basically is, you know, a third party entity that will be created. So similar to what the oil and gas industry does for extracting resources, uh, that third party will raise the capital and then get, you know, ownership of the CO2. So in the U.S., we'll take advantage of the 45Q tax credit, pay sequester a, um, you know, a consulting and IP licensing fee. I forgot to mention that we actually have now the exclusive license on the technology from uh, from Caltech. So the third party entity will deal with sequester and sequester will provide uh, the, you know, the general uh, engineering and um, IP licensing resources. Uh, there will be a fee per ton of CO2 as well. I did not mention the verification technology that we are um, developing, but this will be a third party um, you know, validated technology to help the customer uh, verify in real time that the CO2 that's being captured at their plant is then being sequestered or used somewhere else. Um, so we're, you know, we, we are seeing ourselves as a service provider. Uh, now, in some cases, it might be a more of a joint venture type of approach. Uh, it's really as the ecosystem is growing, uh, these business models are also evolving and it will be dependent uh, on, on the geography in terms of the financing. Europe uh, is, a, is a different model in terms of, uh, um, you know, you, you basically companies have to pay real money uh, very soon for the scope one and scope two emissions. So this is different than the tax incentive that the U.S. government has. Great, thanks. And congrats on the uh, exclusive license for the IP. That's a big milestone. That's great. Thank you. I can follow up. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Clemon. Um, my question is, um, what what data points are you or milestones that you're going to try to achieve um, from here on now and, and until the first pilot? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, many, I would say, but um, the key ones are really, you know, showing that the sorbent is uh, performing the way it's supposed to, to do. So we have a bunch of KPIs that we uh, develop that basically are the base of our uh, chemical engineering design. So as we are uh, improving the formulation of the sorbent, especially with, uh, in relation to the cyclability, uh, you know, we want to make sure as a first step, we're validating all of those. So that's that's the basic. Uh, that's even for the current prototype. For the pilot, uh, what we're looking into is a higher cyclability to go even further uh, with a replacement every four weeks. The original target is two weeks. The pilot target is four weeks. The commercial demonstration is three months replacement frequency. So this is a huge milestone. Uh, the other part is um, in terms of the third party verification. So we're going to bring the technology, the Centennial system to um, 
a third party verification uh, platform such as the National Carbon Capture Center in um, Alabama, if my memory is correct. And um, the, that will be a huge milestone to basically put a stamp on our technology and help us move forward with the, the pilot. Uh, we are in discussion with an EPC on, you know, how what's the best strategy on doing that. We want to make sure that, um, you know, what we, when we are targeting our beachhead market, uh, we add a value to the customer, uh, and and we are, uh, you know, have, doing it at a very low cost. So so this is, you know, as as we're moving forward with the pilot. Thank you. Glenn. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Oh, and I forgot to mention contracts with you know transportation and sequestration, which we, we already have for our pilot in Central California. But obviously, the end of the value chain is super important. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question, maybe a bit similar from the, the last one I had. But it's if you take, I don't know, for one million of uh, tons per year captured, what would mm -hmm. be the cost for the for the, the client and also the the amount yeah. saved in, in taxes or you know down the line? Yeah. So to answer the second part of your question first, the amount saved on taxes will obviously depend on when you are located, where you are located. Now, assuming we are in the US, um, if you're doing the capture and the sequestration, it's an $85 credit total per ton of CO2 captured and sequestered. Uh, our cost, so now to answer the first part of the question, uh, our cost at you know the 1 million ton scale is estimated to be 30 uh, US dollar CapEx plus OPEX for the capture and purification uh, and the compression. And then you add transportation uh, and sequestration and then some added you know verification costs and all of that. So the overall cost per ton of CO2 is way below $85 when you look at the entire value chain. When we are at the smaller end of the point source, that will be you know, a little bit higher. Okay, thanks. It's pretty clear. You're welcome. Any other questions um, from our investor panel before we move forward? So please do not hesitate to reach out uh, if you need more information. Uh, and if you are interested in this opportunity, we're closing in September, October timeline. Awesome. Thank you so much, Clement. And I, I believe there also might be a question coming through in the Zoom chat. Uh, somebody reached out to me about that. So just keep an eye in there. Should come in, okay. yeah. in a minute or two. All right, awesome. Um, then next, I'm going to turn things over to Yusuf um, to talk about Yola Fresh. Um, so Yusuf, you're you're already sharing your screen. Feel free to take it away from here. Yeah, just unmuting. Very good. Thank you very much, Hani. So hello everyone. This is Yusuf from Yola Fresh, and we're basically um, transforming Africa's inefficiencies in agriculture and then food supply chain. So basically our view here is we wanna become one of Africa's largest food supply chain platform. We are focusing mainly on improving the livelihood of smallholder farmers and traditional retailers, reducing food wastage by building an efficient distribution sourcing network uh, backed uh, by technology. We're also addressing two, two major SDG goals where the, the second one to end hunger and then achieve food security as well as ensuring the sustainability uh, in consumption and production. So basically, I mean, if you take the earth and then divide it from the Southern hemisphere, every single country from Colombia, I mean, up to Indonesia, we, we talk to, the, to all those, um, I mean, startups and then scale-ups there, and then they all share the same uh, pain points and the problems. Farmers are not having access to market and retailers are having issues to source their produce. So basically a farmer is relying on an aggregator, spending most of the year or the season um, harvesting and then farming and taking big risks, and then just scoring the lowest margin possible within the supply chain. 
and then uh, and once they actually get access and then sell their produce they are not able to get paid in uh, i mean in uh, in due time the retailers on the other side and i'm talking about traditional ones i'm not talking about the modern trade the big uh, fancy shops i'm talking about mom and pop shops talking about um uh, what we call the push cart or the street side vendors those guys they need to go every single day spend 3 to 4 hours in big wholesale market so they don't have any um, I would say logistics, uh, logistics capabilities so that they can go there. So they need always to rent and then renting on a daily basis is super inefficient. They need, they are also don't have any bargaining power because basically they're just getting one crate for each, uh, for each produce. And this is the minimum order quantity anyway in the, in the wholesale market and the zillions of transactions that are happening with the, with the end consumer is actually not recorded. Because basically they are they are where they are excluded from the financing world, and then nothing is getting recorded. So in your fresh, what we do, we are mainly focusing on the post harvest and then post sale, and our value proposition is super clear. For the farmers, we are ensuring actually to buy uh, produce ten to twenty percent higher than the market rate, which is scoring, which is uh, enabling them to make up to seventy five percent more margin. We are also ensuring that they are getting paid uh, next day. We are also giving them a visibility and then uh, telling them that on Monday I need that much produce on Tuesday and Wednesday, which is something that they're absolutely not able to have uh, in the traditional market. And then convenience as well, because they would be their unique inter in a unique interface to sell or produce. On the other side, we take retailers, so they don't need actually to wake up super early in the morning. We will be providing them their produce at the storefront. Because we'll be absorbing all the overhead, uh, logistics overhead, basically we're not selling below market price, we're just lowering their landed cost and then securing them up to 50% more, uh, more margins on a daily basis. We also grade the produce so that whatever they get, they, if they start to sell at 50 or 60 cents uh, per kg per kilogram, they would also uh, end up the day selling at the same price because they don't need to discount those ungraded or those uh, rotten produce. We give them, uh, I mean, the high quality one. And because we have visibility on both ends, we are able to have uh, to to have a supply uh, a supply chain or a supply and demand synchronization, reducing hence the perishability and then ensuring the quality as well as the food the traceability. And basically, how we do this, we are setting up collection centers uh, close to farmers. So we're talking about a really small at least uh, uh, space where we are close to the farmers. They are getting our produce. Uh, they are getting their produce. Uh, sorted and graded and then put in our crates. And then once it's in our crate, it doesn't change the crate until it gets delivered. So during COVID, there was like one uh, very interesting study where seven person were actually touching the produce before it reaches uh, the, the, the end consumer. So the idea here is that once it's, it is in one crate, it will not be poured again or swapped or changed uh, until it, it gets sold. And this is actually incre increasing uh, their their uh, their shelf life. So everything is then funneled to a fulfillment center. So you just need to keep in mind that everything is just in time. We're not holding any inventory because this is done on a daily basis. And because we are able to get the forecasting um, capability, we are requesting the farmers to harvest in the morning. We are receiving the goods, sending it to the our distribution centers. Uh, by by the end of the day and delivering it to the retailers at the D plus uh, plus one, which is uh, between seven and nine a.m. So less than twenty four hours from harvesting uh, to the retailer. Obviously, this is uh, I mean this is a daily business, and then uh, it uh, requires a lot of capabilities in terms of following up all the data points. So tech is a backbone, and then we have uh, interface for both farmers and retailers as well as the whole heart of the fulfillment and delivery that is uh, managed by, by Tech. Um, and one thing actually, and this is just a side note, and when we've been analyzing um, everything, we just noticed that actually Africa and India is extremely similar. So everyone thinks that uh, India is one country, but actually it's a lot of states and each state is uh, uh, it's a special country where they have their own language, own religion, own food culture, as well as logistics and uh, and uh, 
uh, and uh, consumption habits. So we just realized that there are a lot of similarities. So when we deep dive on India, and then we found two of the major scale ups uh, raised roughly $1 billion uh, both. Uh, and then we, we got a lot of learnings from them. So we spent uh, three weeks um, last month, and then we got a lot of learnings actually to understand how things are scaling. Those guys, they do more than 2,000 tons a day, so 2 million uh, kgs a day, which is super impressive. And it's almost like a, a blessing to have a sneak peek in the future and then to see how things are, could actually work out, digitizing both retailers as well as farmers. But our, our playground will be mainly uh, Africa and then West Africa. So this is a market we're generating slightly above $100 billion in yearly revenues. So we started in uh, in Morocco. Uh, we started the three months ago, uh, by the way. We started in, in Morocco, and the Morocco alone is a $6 billion serviceable market where we have clear two uh, customer profile. The first one is a street side vendor. So it's actually a big table on wheels. Uh, those guys, they handle between two to five to 600 kg of produce. And when people would think that those guys are mobile and then they would vanish, they're actually always in the same spot. So this is actually making it super easy in, in spotting them and then delivering to them the, the produce on a daily basis. On the other side, we have the traditional mom and pop shops, the FMCG retailers. They are slightly lower in numbers, but they have a higher footfall and hence they have a higher um, uh, or, um, uh, average order value. And then both they make up an up to a $6 billion in serviceable market. And even though we've been missing out this by 50%, even though we did a sanity check bottom up and then top down, even by screwing this by 50%, it's still a $3 billion yearly uh, market in Morocco. So we started uh, in March. Uh, and our idea here is that we will always be selling at the market price. So we are not a market maker. We will be selling at the market price. However, the more um, demand we are creating, the higher I can get in a value chain. And I can, and at the farm gate, I can actually get up to 30% for the commodity, which is the potato, onion, and tomato. When I talk about other uh, fruit and vegetables, it can go up to the 70%. Why I'm saying this is I, the value proposition is very clear that we're selling at the right price. Hence, and still they are making uh, making a good margin from retailers, and then I'm buying at a slightly higher price and still making a much better margin for the farmers. So this year uh, we crossed the we already crossed the 2.5 million um, annualized um, uh, revenue, and uh, we are we are tracking to reach the 10 million dollar uh, annualized revenue by the end of the year, um, aiming to reach the 50 million and then 100 million by 2025. And um, while three months of operations, we already have more than 200 active traditional retailers, uh, 100 daily active users, an average order value that is slightly uh, below $90. We have a super high retention rate, uh, almost um, uh, 82%. So the re repeat rate is just uh, excellent. We, start, we wanted to start first with the potato onion with very safe, um, safe items. We just uh, found ourselves uh, thrown in the very deep water very early. They say, it's either you bring us the whole catalog or actually we cannot work with you. So right now we operate with 66 items and this is vegetables only. So we started with the most difficult one with each vegetable. Uh, we are launching next month fruit and fruit is two to three times higher value, hence better margin um, for us. So we are moving almost 25 tons um, daily. That's slightly more than 1,000 crates uh, daily. And then we standardize all the crates. So we have a single crate. And then inside, we have different produce. So that in logistics and operations, it's like super easy uh, to manage uh, and then to optimize. We also have a cumulative $300,000 revenue. Only um, last month, we did $150,000. We grow at almost 20 to 22% uh, week on week. And then we became gross margin positive starting from uh, last month. My co-founder and I, uh, from, I mean, almost childhood friends, uh, he came to me last April when I was managing a VC uh, fund and, uh, and he was pitching to me the idea, hey, I'm working on this. Would this be interesting actually to be funded? Half an hour later, we became co-founders because we were looking both to an impactful idea, something that can be big 
and something that could be uh, that can also impact uh, life of people. So he uh, has an, an extensive logistics uh, and marketplace uh, um, experience through Jumia. Myself, I am worked uh, worked in Samsung as well as uh, managing the exclusive uh, PNG distributor uh, in Morocco. I also was heading uh, Karim, the ride hailing company that was acquired by Uber for four years. So I experienced life where money was uh, growing on trees and then there, we could spend like there is no tomorrow until actually moving to, hey, we guys, we need actually to become positive. And then we made it and then we became a bit positive. Uh, and then I was also managing a VC, um, a VC uh, out of Morocco for seed and series A startups. So it's uh, we also managed actually to convince more than 30, 34 warriors and that's uh, within only four months. Uh, so all the exec level is is settled. So the logistics, um, HR, sales, procurement, um, as well as finance are are, are on board. Uh, and uh, yes, we managed to also uh, score the first prize in Jitex uh, last month uh, in the AgriTech uh, sustainability um, category. And we closed our uh, pre-seed. Uh, in April as well, so we raised $1.8 million, uh, mainly to hire the resources, and this is done because we, we finalized the A-team, and then we, we, we deeply believe that um, having the A-team on a compound effect will actually create much more value. Scaling the first phase uh, out of Casablanca, developing the infrastructure, as well as integrating all the tech capabilities. Uh, we are funded by super high profile business angels, as well as two funds, one uh, based out of the US and another one on a Pan-African uh, region. I hope I was clear and brief and uh, ready for the questions. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, I'll bring in the judges onto the screen right now. And uh, yeah, feel free to dive in, um, investors. Hi, Yusuf. Um, I'll start off with questions. Thank you for the Hi, presentation. Um, my, uh, my question is, how do you, how do you go to uh, developing that asset light model with the collection centers, the fulfillment centers, and the distribution centers? Yeah, that's a very good question. So basically, I mean, we take it on a three step. The most important one is the distribution center, and then we go upstream. So that in the distribution center, we're just renting uh, space, and then we're renting it with maximum two months notice period. So the minute we want to like increase capacity, uh, we just can actually just give them a notice period and then move to a, a bigger facility. Second, we're just we're always uh, utilizing three uh, third party logistics, so three PLs. So just a phone call and then asking them, hey, tomorrow I need extra capacity in terms of trucks, in terms of logistics, in terms of labors, and then we can actually have it very easily. So we are committed to stay asset light. We're committed just to have maximum two months contract and then be able to breathe, I would say, uh, whenever we feel that we need to increase capacity. Thank you, very interesting. Uh, let's see. I, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, you, your business is really interesting to me. Uh, very quickly, uh, my background, I worked at a, a company called Whoop for two years, which is like a health wearable company. So I know a little bit about hardware cost structures with software revenue models. Uh, so I think um, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about uh, that 82% retention rate you mentioned. Yeah. Because I think you you also said you launched just three months ago. So is yeah. that sort of like a projected annual retention Absolutely uh, not. Yeah. I mean, again, the beauty of this, and this is the beauty of this business, this is a daily business. I mean, I, I'm actually interacting with my customer or my retailer 26 times a month. So extremely rapidly, I mean, within two weeks, I mean, for us, an active user is like a two weeks to, if he doesn't order within two, week, two weeks, something actually is, is wrong. So when we see that the 82%, this is a daily retention rate, which means that out of 100 that are active today, 82 are ordering the day after. And then the others probably like the order just two or three days uh, before. But um, th this is how we actually uh, keep having the, the retention rate. And this is actually bringing also a very good point, which is due to this high frequency and then I would even call super high frequency, we iterate on a daily basis. So every time we're just like adding up uh, either a new way of working, a new way of interaction, 
And then one thing that we need to keep in mind that those two population, both farmers and retailers, they have never been approached by any organized company or any technology-based company. So we are on the four-step uh, phase to digitize them. So the first step is actually having a sales, a sales executive or sales team hand-holding and then explaining to them the value proposition and then getting the order. On the other side, we have a procurement executive talking to the farmers and then trying actually to convince them to get the goods. We are slightly more advanced on the sales side than the procurement side because, again, our strategy is first to build the demand. And then if I have 1,000 active users, if I buy 10 tons and then each one is taking 10, uh, 10 kg, it's very easy actually to, to sell it in a split second. Whereas the other way around is I have a produce, I'm going to the market and I'm, I'm just exposing it, hoping that I would be selling it at the right price. So this is by building this, this, uh, this vacuum, whatever you put on top, it will be actually sucked and then, and then consumed. So the second phase right now from the sales team is that instead of going and visiting those guys, they're just giving them a call. Hey, what is your order for, for the next day? Because we always work on a pre-order uh, a pre-order approach. The third phase that we're launching within two weeks is taking our best customers and then telling them, hey, guys, if you want to be to order, call us. We will not be calling you. I know it's going to be super difficult for us to actually pick up the phone and do it, but it's actually a way for us to not only prove that our product market fit is really there and then we validate it, but at the same time, we are preparing for the last phase, which is putting an app between their hand. 93% of our customers are having smartphone and the app is ready. So it's actually just a matter of time transitioning so that they can have the they can they can order themselves, pick up the app, and then instead of just sending a WhatsApp um, note, voice note, or actually answering the phone, they can just um, choose how many crates of all the SKUs the, or all the items they want, and then press order, and then they will receive it the day after. And this will also happen in parallel with with the farmers understanding their land, understanding the harvesting cycle, and then categorizing them and knowing that this guy will actually uh, be ready by May, second week of May, and then he's having 45 tons of potato within the three months period. And then we can actually give him the forecast on what to harvest on a daily basis. That's great. Yeah. And it's clear from the platform, you know, as you get more participation and critical mass, there's going to be that virtuous circle Absolutely. Uh, of the platform improving. So very because interesting. Right now, already with 100 active user. If you take that, everyone is taking one crate of potato, for example, and one crate of potato is 30 kilograms. That's already a three ton on a daily basis. Yeah. So going and then, for example, negotiating a 10 ton weekly consumption, that's already a really interesting uh, quantity with a farmer. So we are, we are, we at, even, at, I mean, that's the scary. And then the good thing is that three months uh, down the line, we're already able actually to go and grabbing more, more margin, that's the first thing. And second thing, getting the goods slightly earlier, which will allow us actually to always continue deliver on our value proposition, which is reliability and then delivering the retailers. Because if, if the retailers are not receiving their goods, they cannot sell, hence they cannot make their daily income. That sounds great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. For me, it's all clear, actually. It's been very comprehensive. Um, my question was Iris, is, so the, for me, it's, it's super clear. Thanks for that. Excellent. Good. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Clément opened, opened the gate, so I, I'll do it myself as well. I mean, we closed our pre-seed round. We're opening our seed round by, uh, by September. Uh, and then, yeah, basically, we, we already actually started, let, let's say that we started the company in the best and then the, and the worst uh, time. Best time, worst time, because last year, money was so scarce that, uh, that it was difficult to raise. In general, this is what we thought. But the, it was also the best uh, moment because we built this uh, with the clear path to profitability. So already right now on our fourth month of operation, we're already tracking the gross margin, the contribution margin, really following line by line, following the unit economics, because, hey, we are going in the right direction. We're just buying time to get there, but we want to build an institution that will inspire and last. Uh, and doing well by doing good is something that we, we believe in very deeply. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yusuf. Um, really excited to see where this goes. As you said, it's uh, it's very early in the journey, but very promising at this stage. Um, all right, Ahmad, 
uh, you are going to be up next and uh, sharing Intel with us. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ahmed Zamdi. I'm the founder and CEO of Until. We're a seed stage ag tech company bridging the gap between farm and fork. So how big is this gap exactly? Well, it turns out it's pretty big. Produce in the US is mainly farmed in California and Arizona. And if you're in Boston, like I am, the salads that we eat every day are trucked over for over 3,000 miles to get to our plates. And over that eight day journey, they've lost over half of their nutritional value. What makes things worse is that half of the product that enters the supply chain doesn't make it to its final destination. So we wanted to talk to the people that are most affected by this problem, institutional food buyers. And we asked them, what are the biggest pain points that they had when they're trying to source product? Turns out the majority of them are directly related to the failures of that supply chain. Then we asked them, what do you look for when you're trying to source new product or work with a new supplier? And these traits are directly related to what the downstream customer typically looks for and shops for, and quality and locally grown product always top the list. These conversations were really interesting because in a very margin conscious business in the produce world, a lot of distributors were willing to throw price out the window in exchange for consistent quality and consistent delivery. So what if I told you we can cut the supply chain down from eight days to under 24 hours? And we can boost the, the shelf life of the product from two days to over two weeks in customers' fridges. And we can do all of this while cutting down emissions by 30%. That's what we're working on at Until. We've built a farming platform that can grow food closer to where consumers are eating it. We can do it at scale and at comparable prices to field-grown organic product. Uh, without using any of the nasty stuff, of course, that's typically associated with farming. In short, it's called large-scale vertical farming. The large scale because it's done in large open spaces like a warehouse, and the vertical because we stack our fields on top of each other like you see in this picture here. Because of our technology, we can place these farms virtually anywhere, closer to the distribution centers of buyers, giving them access to year-round locally grown product, which is a growing category in the produce market. In the US, fruit and vegetable sales are quite a large market. So we're focusing on just the New England region and specifically on two crop categories within that market, greens and strawberries to start off, making up about a billion dollars in sales annually. Through our market research, we found that two thirds of New Englanders are always looking for locally grown product when they're shopping and they're willing to make the purchase if they're presented with the opportunity, which the majority of the year they're not able to. So vertical farming is a very new and emerging farming practice. You may have heard a bit of it in the news. Um, technology is really key in getting it right and being able to build a profit profitable operation. So we spent four years doing research with Northeastern University to try to understand how plants grow and how do we balance the inputs with quality and yield. And over that path, we've uh, created hardware and software to be able to take that knowledge and scale it up to feed a wholesale market. We filed two patents that protect two um, and a few other key pieces uh, of our technology around irrigation and how the plants are managed within the operation, which make us uniquely more operationally efficient and capital efficient compared to our competitors. And here's how we compare to our competitors. Our crop cycles are significantly shorter than anyone else's, so we can fit more within a year. And our farms are running for longer periods of time because of the way we isolate our crop. I'll elaborate more on that later. From a PL impact perspective, we're six times less productive uh, per unit area while using nine times less power and half the number of people on our farms. And those last two metrics are the largest cost contributors to any vertical farm. So to scale this up and to bring this to commercial level, um, we're planning on successively building larger farms to get to a point where we have a network of farms to feed the nation. Currently, we've built uh, and are currently commissioning our first big pilot farm that's right outside of Boston. Uh, it's going to be producing four SKUs of leafy greens that will be distributed 
uh, into the grocery retail channel in Massachusetts. Uh, and that allows us to address our beachhead market and really address the issue, the gap that we saw on the grocery store shelf. Next, we'll build a bigger farm to expand our skew mix within the leafy greens category, introduce strawberries, which are, is our next crop, and broaden distribution across New England. To scale this nationally, we're planning on franchising our entire platform and supporting our farmers remotely through our software. We've partnered with Wilson Farm, a very large and established uh, produce distributor that's established around New England to carry and distribute our product uh, later this fall. So let me introduce you to our farm that's in Hudson, Mass. It's the big pilot farm. Um, it's fully automated from seed to harvest with zero labor in the operational part of the farm. It's stacked with a variety of sensors to keep track of the plant's health and also give us a very granular look at traceability within the production chain. Uh, and that's very important from a food safety standpoint. It is a platform, so we can grow a variety of crops on here, not just leafy greens. And because of the modularity of our growing fields, uh, we can reduce uh, service downtimes and cleaning downtimes, so our farm is running for longer periods of time. It sits on about 8,000 square feet. It goes up 20 feet high, and it can produce about 125,000 pounds of leafy greens per year. A bit about our, our timeline. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we spent a significant amount of time doing research with Northeastern University. Um, and along the way, we filed a couple of patents and uh, won a few awards and participated in Mass Challenge. When we were ready to commercialize, we leased the facility in Hudson and began construction on it. Um, but today, our main focus is revenue. And the Hudson facility has a, a revenue capacity of about 91K MRR and the capacity to bring us to cash flow positivity. The, our team is uh, fully stacked with some great talent. I'm an industrial engineer, and in my prior life, I used to build highly automated manufacturing facilities. John, our lead grower, um, is a botanist and has a lot of experience in plant science. And Mark, our mechanical engineer, has a lot of systems engineering experience. Uh, our advisory board helps us out where we need, uh, whether it's product creation and branding or um, business strategy. So that was until um, we're trying to bring next level farming for next level flavor. Thank you guys so much for listening in and I'm ready for any questions. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, investors, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, don't, I don't have a, it's super clear, to be honest. I don't have one that jumps to mind. Maybe something is going to come up. Uh, yeah, I can, I can jump in with a question. Um, first of all, I should come by and tour your facility sometime. I'm also in Boston. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah. So More than really, welcome to. Really interesting. Um, so I guess... This is more uh, maybe a general question, but like, what is the plan in terms of go to market? Because I imagine, you know, getting a new SKU, a new product into a supermarket uh, requires sort of a lot of brand building, a lot of recognition or good placement. Is that sort of like a big part of your cost structure right now initially? Uh, how do you think about that? Yeah, so the produce industry, you're right, but the produce industry is a little different uh, in the way it works. Um, it's the slotting fees and slotting costs and costs to get a, a product shelved um, is very expensive when you're talking about shelf stable stuff. But in the produce aisle, because um, of the shelf life and the freshness requirement of the product, things operate tend to operate a little differently. Um, suppliers are or retailers are a lot more selective in what they go with, and they tend to go for um, a supplier that can give them the value add, uh, not just the product itself. So uh, lower shrink rate, uh, better shelf life, a higher quality and consistency of the quality of the product, and then safety and traceability are, are becoming a very big portion of that. Um, so it becomes a little easier to insert yourself uh, into that shelf space. 
And over the past few years with the growth of the organic category and now the growth of the free from, which is free from pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, uh, there's a huge gap because there are actually no producers that can do that. Um, so that's why getting into market today, there is a gap for us to insert ourselves into. And we have one large competitor here in Northeast and in, in the Northeast called Little Leaf Farms. If you're familiar with them, they're a greenhouse. Um, they do not operate in the non-lettuce leafy greens category, which is why we chose our four SKUs the way we did, um, because there's a serious gap for them um, in that marketplace. From food service, it becomes a totally different game. That's all wholesale, zero branding. It's more of a commodity market. Economics are a little different. It's higher margin for us, but lower uh, price per pound um, on, the, on the revenue side. Right, and then is your facility, is it sort of, can you be variable in terms of demand and your growing schedule uh, based? I imagine there's some sort of yeah. cyclical nature to consumption of leafy greens. Yeah, so because, so one of the key pieces of our IP is that modularity that, that I talked yeah. about. And because we broke up our fields, we can basically plant and have our growing schedule be whatever we want it and change it up really quickly. So if our retailer, let's say Whole Foods comes back and say, hey, we're seeing a lot more demand for kale during the summer months, within 11 days, we can switch over our facility to start pumping out more kale for them and to meet that demand. And that's also because of our, our crop cycle times are significantly short. They're actually 11 days from seed to harvest versus the traditional 50. Um, we can react a lot faster to the market. Great, awesome, thanks so much. I have a question actually on that, that flexibility point. Is there a minimum size for each unit that you, you must have to be cash flow positive on it? Or can you actually break it down and be closer to, to the clients, let's say? Yeah, so um, there is a minimum size requirement. Um, the 8,000 square foot facility that we built in Hudson is kind of on that line. It is the minimum uh, for cash flow positivity. Now, us as a business, we have a lot of overhead because I have a team and you know computer scientists and stuff like that, which a franchisor, um, in our case, or someone who, who would franchise our technology wouldn't have. Uh, so theirs might be a little smaller um, it might not be 8,000 square feet, it might be six um, to start generating positive cash flows. And also that, that really depends on real estate, um, if they're renting or buying or they're closer to the city or out of the city. Um, we're, we're kind of suburban, so real estate costs specifically up here in the Northeast are significantly inflated as compared to other parts of the country. Uh, so that kind of plays a role into it as well. Great, thanks. Thank you for the presentation, Ahmed. Um, who who ultimately owns the the uh, vertical IP. farming? Okay. Yeah. So um, we did do research with Northeastern, but we fully own all of the IP and the patents um, uh, until owns one hundred percent of it. Um, we we don't have any co collaborators or co owners of any of our technology. It's fully in-house. And, and how's the the strategy to build out the um, the farming and the warehouses? Do you partner with someone? Is that uh, someone you guys do internally? We currently, we did it all internally. So we lease the facility. We don't own the building, uh, but we take basically a bare bones steel structure warehouse with a concrete pad. And then we put a bunch of stuff in it. We basically build a room inside of there that's like a kind of a clean room. Uh, and we put all of our equipment inside. From a construction standpoint, the big infrastructure stuff, plumbing, electricity, walls, we don't do any of that. We have contractors. Um, but the assembly of our equipment, all of the robots, the lights, all of that stuff, we put that all together and we assemble all of that because it is our design, uh, we know how to put it together and how to assemble it. And and you you discuss or you mentioned the uh, cutting down emissions. How do you how do you do that with the power and, and the labor? So it's uh, it's two factors. One, our food miles are significantly lower. So when you're buying a truckload of lettuce or arugula from California, 
that trucking costs a lot in carbon emissions. Also on farm in California, emissions are quite large for harvesting equipment and whatnot. And then um, we save a significant portion because we use power a lot more efficiently on our farm than a traditional vertical farm would or a greenhouse um, because our crop cycles are lower and we use lighting and HVAC a lot more efficiently. Uh, so that's where we get our 30%. Thank you. Ahmed, since we have um, a, a little bit more time, one question that, that I got um, through the chat was just, if you could explain more how you're able to um, reduce like the growing cycle to 11 days, um, how, how are you able to do that so quickly? Um, without going into uh, trade secrets and proprietary technology, that was a product of a lot of our research that we did with Northeastern um, in understanding how crops grow, what are the stimuli to get the um, the metabolis the metabolic rate of the plant to really uh, um, expand, um, and we des designed an irrigation manifold basically that can enhance that. And I think that's all I can say about that. Um, but basically, it 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 gives the plant exactly what it wants when it wants it. So it it speeds through the growing cycle without really limiting um, or creating any limits on its growth rate. Awesome. Well, very cool stuff. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for, for sharing. Um, yeah, thank you. We're going to move on to our last presentation from uh, Kamal, um, he, who's working on rabbit mobility. So Kamal, um, turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Hani, for organizing the, this demo day. Um, and thanks, everyone, for your time. Uh, let me know once you can see the screen. We can, we can see it. Perfect, perfect. So my name is Kamel. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Rabbit. Rabbit is Africa's largest micro-mobility platform. Uh, and the problem we're trying to solve is very clear. It's traffic. Uh, there's a dire need for micro-mobility in, in, in Egypt, especially in other North African markets, based on numbers from the government stats office. 12% of the potential earnings of Egyptians are lost because they're stuck in traffic. And that this is caused by the high number of cars on the streets and the very limited parking spots that ends up creating this traffic. And the solution was building Gravit, an on-demand mobility platform for clean, short-distance transportation. We use light electric vehicles. We started with the e-scooters back in November 2020, and then we added e-bikes last year, and we're currently working on adding e-vespas as well. As well. Each of these vehicles uh, is, is convenient and is a solution for different types of, of trips. So uh, a trip of one to three kilometers would be great on an e-scooter. Three to five kilometers would be very convenient on an e-bike. And a longer distance trip would be convenient on e-vespa. And when we started, we started doing some tests uh, by trying rides like three kilometer rides or shorter either comparing it by an Uber or a Kareem or taking a rabbit. And typically using a rabbit vehicle was 34% cheaper than taking an Uber or Kareem and 30% faster because the average traffic speed in Cairo is around 15 kilometers per hour because of the traffic. And we have, uh, in terms of revenue streams, we have a B2C model and a B2B model. Our B2C, we have two different offerings, a paper minute offering, which is the typical offering you'll find in any micro mobility operator. And we also have a paper day offering that ends up like a least to own model. And we've also started piloting a B2B model where we offer our vehicles as a long lease to delivery operators, which typically save them around 30% on their delivery costs. And that's a key cost center for delivery operators that they need to work on, uh, on reducing. And since January 2022, so, a bit, a bit of, of history about Rabbit. We started uh, in Feb 2020, uh, and we started Feb 2020. A week later, COVID hit. We had to stop again until November 2020 when we relaunched, we relaunched again. And because there was a lot of concerns on the market here in Egypt in terms of infrastructure, in terms of security of the vehicles or the, the assets, we focused on 
top elite neighborhoods that have the highest purchasing power, high, highest infrastructure in Egypt. And that these were very, very selective, four or five neighborhoods max across Cairo. And we've stayed the entire uh, Q4 2020 and the entire year of 2021 focused on these neighborhoods until we developed our technology arm and our operations arm to launch in the typical neighborhood that you find across Egypt. And that was in Gen 2022. We were fulfilling around 6,600 rides per day, per month. And we've been growing since then until May 2023. We're fulfilling around 37,000 rides, uh, 37, rides per month. We're currently in seven cities across Egypt. We've, had, we've served 130,000 riders across Egypt and they've done around 550,000 rides. And based on our last survey that was done in Q1 2023, 65% of these rides that were done uh, during the, these 18 months were rides replacing car rides, which is the exact type of rides that we're looking for, that, that users leave their cars, leave the, do not order Uber, do not order Kareem, and they take an e-scooter and e-bike instead. That's how, that's how, for us, we believe we're leaving an impact in the environment. You need to be economical, you need to be fun, you need to be convenient, and that's how you get users to adopt environmentally friendly solutions. And our focus on Launchpad was Egypt. Egypt has around 10 million vehicles based on government uh, start office. 70% of the trips fulfilled by these vehicles are below eight kilometers in distance, which typically could be done by an e-scooter, e-bike, or an e-Vespa. Based on these numbers, 6.2 billion short distance rides are done annually in Egypt. And these are valid at $6 billion. And during the past year, while we were expanding in the different cities, we got approached by the Ministry of Transport to start drafting uh, and working on getting the first license for a micromobility operator across Africa. And we're currently in the final phase of reviewing these licensing framework. We're expecting by next quarter to get awarded this license, and this will be the first license for a micromobility operator across Africa. And this definitely puts us in a great position and great capability to expand to other African markets. We're looking at other African markets, specifically North African markets. We've been focusing on expanding to Morocco over the past couple of months. Uh, and it's, the total African market is valued at around 60 billion short distance rides, and that's around $55 billion of market. In terms of unit economics, our current econ unit economics are positive, and we're expecting uh, by December 2023 to hit uh, around $1.09 uh, gross profit per vehicle per day. We start with the revenue per vehicle at, per day at $4. And then when you remove all the different costs between on-ground operations, depreciation, marketing, payment fees, even including licensing fee, insurance, and charging, even theft and vandalism, you end up with a gross profit of $1.09 per vehicle per day. And that's around 25% gross profit. It's a matter of in adding more and more fleet and adding more volume of vehicles to turn profitable and turn cash flow positive. We've, we've actually achieved positive EBITDA back in July 2022. And since then, we had part of our fleet got depreciated and salvaged. But hence, we got back again in the negative uh, cash flow. And the, the beauty of doing this in Egypt that we have minimal spend on customer acquisition. Our user base grew from Jan 2022. We had 18,000 users on the app. And by end of May 2023, 16 months later, we were at 320,000 users on the app. And that's entirely organic. 85% of, of our users come organically, 11% through referrals, and 4% through social media. And that's how we're achieving an LTV to CAC ratio of 6x. We've spent almost 90 days on the App Store and the Google Play Store uh, as number four. And uh, without spending anything on media buying, we were above Swivel, we were above Kareem, above Booking, and that's all based on the word of mouth and the expansion that was happening across the different cities. We got backed by the most active investors globally and locally. In total, we've raised around $1.05 million in capital, and we've generated around $880,000 of revenue. And this gives us a capital efficiency of 84%. When compared by other benchmarks in the industry, such as Hilbus and Bird, we're actually doing double their capital efficiency. We're very keen, we're very financial aware, and we're very keen to have any capital that we raise, we invest into assets that generate revenues. We're currently burning less than $10,000 a month. 
Um, and you mentioned the investors, we've, we got backed by 500 Global, this enabled office back in 2022, and we had Phalax Startups, which is an investment arm under the Ministry of Investment in Egypt that invested with us back in 2020. We also have angel investors from McKinsey, PwC, Monsoon Automotive, which are the partners of General Motors Manufacturing across Africa, and SoftBank, AWS, and Cisco. Our team, we have 80 people working at Rabbit. There were three co-founders, myself, Mansouri. We have almost eight years of combined experience in management and strategy consulting between PwC and McKinsey in Dubai and London offices. Um, and myself and Basim, we have startup and tech experience for almost three years. Basim is your typical uh, genius engineer that used to design, program, manufacture, and compete with light electric vehicles that he used to manufacture in Singapore and Malaysia. That's our team. We're very keen on solving the problem of transportation. There's no one serving the short distance transportation across Africa, and that's what we believe we can do. We're currently raising $1.2 million to expand our presence to 15 cities across North Africa. With $1.2 million, we'll be able to be profitable by Q2 2024, and by then we'll have the first license across Africa for micromobility. And the targets with this round is to achieve 1.7 million rides and $1.4 million of revenue, operate a fleet of 1,500 vehicles, and have a, an average 70,000 monthly active users. And our promise is to get a million cars off the road, 10 million liters of gas saved, and 500,000 tons of CO2 emissions reduced. We want to have 100,000 vehicles on ground every trip under eight kilometers to be run by one of our vehicles, saving around 30% on cost and time for our users. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamal. Um, I will uh, turn it over to the investors. And as I mentioned, this is the last pitch. So yeah, thank you everyone so much um, who was able to join and tune in. Uh, and, and thank you once again to the founders and investors for participating. Um, yep, open it up to you, to, um, to the investor panel. Hi, Kevin. I have a question. Thank, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, the first question around the competition. So who are the other players in the market today? In, in so Egypt? Currently, we are the only player in the market. There are two other players that are still in a very early stage with a fleet of 20 to 30 vehicles. So we don't really consider it competition. However, on, on the GCC side, there's a lot of competition. There's European uh, operators even and uh, and local operators, but we are not focused on the GCC. We're only focused on Africa. And currently, as we stand, we're the largest operator in Africa, even though we're a very small one compared to European and US operators. Okay. And and at scale, how do you avoid uh, you know vandalism and theft, etc.? Sure. So we're currently at a two percent theft and vandalism rate. And that's much lower than the European average and the US average. The European is around 6% and the US is 7% theft and vandalism on an annual basis. And what really helped us is that we've added uh, specific sensors to our IoT device. We've added an electronic cable lock to our vehicles where users have to lock their vehicles after ending the ride, uh, the ride in a light pole or a fence and take a photo of this vehicle, of the vehicle while it's locked in order to end the ride. This photo gets validated by a model that we've been training with AWS, and it does the image validation whether the vehicle is properly locked or not in one to two seconds, and it has currently a 92% accuracy. So this for us was a key, um, a key barrier to having a high theft and vandalism rate. Okay, if I haven't had another one, but I forgot, so maybe it's gonna come back. <laughs> Thanks for that. You're welcome. Hi, Kamal. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is, how do you navigate the different markets, um, especially in North Africa? Um, it sounded like you had to stop or pause operations for some time in, in Egypt. And how, how do you navigate through that when that occurs? So when we had to stop our operations in Egypt, it was because of COVID back in 2020. Uh, and back then we were only focused on Egypt on only specific neighborhoods in, Ar in Cairo. Currently we're in, we're in seven cities across Egypt. 
with different uh, with different weather, for example. So when it comes really hot in the summer, we move them to other cities on the on the north coast on on the Mediterranean Sea. So it becomes the weather is better and you don't affect the ridership significantly. When we look at the, at other markets across Africa, we focus first on North Africa, given that North Africa has a lot of dynamics and challenges, same as Egypt. Uh, and the key market we were looking at was Morocco. We've we've visited the market the past couple of months. So we've done our field visits, selected our cities, and we actually found a local operator in Morocco in, in a, a much earlier stage than us, but they already have presence across different cities. And we've been in talks on a, on a, on a potential merger slash acquisition through a share swap. And this could potentially be our entry point to the Moroccan market. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Great presentation. I uh, love the service. Uh, I'm curious, I was doing a little math because uh, there's lots of great numbers on your slides. And I think one slide said something like 550,000 uh, rides across 130,000 riders. Uh, so that, that tells kind of like an average of four rides uh, per rider, but I'm sure that's on like a distribution, right? Where some people are just riding once and then they churn out, but then there's probably some who are doing, you know, 10, 20, 30 rides. I'm curious, sort of, do you know who those users are? Uh, and is there sort of, sort of like a plan to focus on them? Sure, so, so we actually, that's what we focused on the past uh, the past three four months. We had a couple of uh, feedback points that we received in the surveys that we keep doing. Our support team keeps doing, and a key uh, feedback point was that we needed to add Arabic, Arabic language to our our app. So a lot of users know how to navigate the app through videos on social media. They don't understand how to any any messages that we sent in English. So we started adding Arabic language to our app, and this increased ridership per, per user. Now it's around five rides per user per day uh, as an average. And we also worked on uh, understanding what are the key challenges in our service. And the key challenge at the moment is that they need to walk an average of eight to 10 minutes to get to the nearest vehicle, which is not really convenient given that the trip is a 10 minute trip. So what we're currently focusing on with the new round is to deploy more and more fleet inside the same cities that we're currently operating and getting this number of eight to 10 minutes down to three to four minutes max. And that's when the service becomes more and more convenient and you can improve the retention just from working on the convenience uh, convenience part. Great, thanks. Um, and then just from sort of a growth perspective, uh, this is more of a comment than a question, but uh, 6X LTV to CAC, is great, but it also might mean, you know, you've got room to spend a little bit more on sales and marketing and, and you're missing out on some growth. So I'd say, uh, you know, if, if you get the budget, definitely spend it. And I think you'll find the customers. Definitely, definitely. We want to spend more and we know we should spend more given that this is all happening organically, which means that there is a lot of room to get more and more by spending strategically. So we were really enjoying the ride that it's happening organically and we're getting all of this boom organically and now it's the time to spend and and double down on that growth awesome uh well best of luck very Thank very you. cool yeah since um Kamal, since we have a, a little bit of extra time um one question from me that i think would be great to hear about just given that we have you know audience from all over the world would be to share a little bit more about the payment mechanisms that you use as well. Um, I know there's like a perception uh, of the Middle East and Egypt being like very cash heavy. So I'm interested how you um, how you actually accept payments through the platform and what like um, digital payment solution adoption is like in the Egyptian market. Sure, sure. So honestly, even though COVID was, was a disaster for any business, but it really boosted online payments here in Egypt. And now it's around... 30% of the payments happening in Egypt are happening online and shopping happening in Egypt is happening online. And that was never a dream that we thought of. And our currently only payment method that we have is through, through online payments, card payments. And even though we know this might be limiting, but still in, in, in the areas, in the neighborhoods and cities that we're operating, it's very common to have a card and use it online. And that's how we haven't, we haven't faced any issues with that. And for us, adding a card on the app is 
a sort of an insurance because we don't have insurance yet on our vehicles because the fleet size is still uh, on the lower end. But once we have insurance, we insure our vehicles, which is, ha which is expected to happen once we close the round and bring another 500 vehicles to our fleet, we will add pay, uh, like cash payments or teleco payments. You can pay by your teleco balance, for example. Uh, but definitely, for for honestly, for for, my, for me, it was a surprise that we're we're able to grow this growth and get around 0.3 percent of the Egyptian population to add their cards on the app and ride with us. Awesome. All right. Any other any other questions um, from the investor panel? Otherwise, yeah, once again, thank you to all of the founders. Thank you, investors, so much for your participation. Um, thanks to everyone who joined. Dropped a bunch of links in the chat to become a member of the Viaca Network. Um, and look forward to hearing from you all if you have any feedback on this event. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to, to stay in touch through the network. Um, thanks, everyone, and, and have a great day, evening, wherever you are in the world. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Holly. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.